Hello, and welcome to the next in this series of the Hoag Community Education uh, Series. My name is Nick Hilbassi, and I'm a cardiologist here at uh, Hoag Hospital. And I wanted to talk today about a subject I'm very passionate about, and that is achieving heart health via seven simple steps. So what is health? It's a term we use all the time, um, but what does it really mean? Is health the absence of disease? Or is it the presence of certain positive attributes or traits? And I'm gonna argue in today's discussion that it's actually the presence of certain positive traits. And I'd love to get your feedback about whether you agree or disagree. So I thought we could start with a simple example. So as a cardiologist, we see, we see patients in the emergency room who come in with a heart attack. And so in this example here, Mr. Smith is coming in with a heart attack and we rush him to the cath lab and he gets a stent. And sometimes when I see a patient like Mr. Smith, I ask myself, what was going on with him one year ago? If he had no symptoms a year prior to his heart attack, was he truly healthy? So this led me to do some research and I identified uh, some important work that's being done by the American Heart Association that I wanted to share with you today. And that is, what if you had a guide to ensure a longer life, to prevent heart disease, to feel stronger and healthier now and later, and to provide a better quality of life as you invest in your relationships and life goals? And speaking of goals, when I talk to patients in the office, I ask them, what is your goal? And I invariably hear, it's not just about my quantity of life, how long I live, but it's how meaningful is my life, how meaningful are whatever years I do have. And that's where I think the American Heart Association's Life Simple 7 success plan, I find some benefit and I think you might as well. Because without a plan, you're likely to experience a higher risk for heart disease and stroke an increased likelihood of illness and disability, an increased need for surgeries, medications, and treatments, and a reduced quality of life. And we see patients with all of these problems. And if there's a way to step back in time and help them with this simple plan, it's something I wish I could do. So for you listening to this talk in the audience, I want you to really take these lessons to heart, pardon the pun. So. This is where the American Heart Association comes up with life simple seven, living better. And let's talk about what that means. So the mission is to build healthier lives free of cardiovascular disease and stroke. And the goal on a nationwide level is to improve the health of all Americans by 20% while reducing deaths from cardiovascular disease and stroke by 20%. And these are the life simple seven, and we're going to go through them one by one, starting with blood pressure. So why is blood pressure so important? You know, they call hypertension the silent killer, because if you have high blood pressure, you don't necessarily know that you have a problem. You feel totally fine, potentially. But there are long lasting health consequences to having high blood pressure. And so in fact, high blood pressure is the single most significant risk factor for heart disease. One out of every three American adults has high blood pressure, and many, dare I say most, may not even know it. So what can you do to take action? The first most important thing is know your numbers. Make sure you find out what is your blood pressure. We cannot treat it until we know what it is. Track your progress. If you can get a blood pressure cuff for home and check your blood pressure in the mornings every so often and track what it is, then when you go to, to visit with your doctor, whether it's your primary care doctor or your cardiologist, we can track your progress after potentially intervening on your lifestyle or in some cases starting a medication to lower your blood pressure. And remember the foundation to a good blood pressure is healthy habits, eating well, staying active. And speaking of staying active, 
staying active is so important for every part of your body, your mind, your body, and your soul. And it's a great early warning system for your heart. If you go for a walk every morning for 30 minutes a day, and one day you're only able to go 10 minutes and you have to stop and rest because you're feeling some chest pressure or you're feeling some shortness of breath, that's an early warning sign that we need to investigate what's going on. But if you're sedentary, we don't have that early warning system. So not only is it a good preventative measure, but it can detect if you have disease. So people who exercise have better health than people who do not. That's a simple thing to say, and it sounds rather obvious, yet so many Americans unfortunately do not take the time to be physically active. So this is the time to take action. Make the decision to get moving. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't need a gym membership. Something as simple as going outside for a walk is one of the best things you can do. And for those of you who live in our community near here in Hogue Hospital, we have the advantage of living in such a beautiful area where we have great weather year round. So that removes one excuse for not being able to walk outside. Choose activities you can enjoy. I hear a lot of patients say, I just hate cardio. I hate jogging. I hate, well, that's great. Then find something that you enjoy. It could be swimming. It could be lifting weights. It could be doing push-ups. It could be rowing. It could be dance. It could be water aerobics. Whatever you enjoy, that's fine. You don't have to jog. Third element of Life Simple 7 is controlling your cholesterol. So cholesterol is what deposits in the arteries of your heart. And when that reaches a critical level, that plaque that builds up that is made out of cholesterol, when it breaks off, can lead to a heart attack. So if you control your cholesterol, the odds of you developing that plaque is much reduced. So when there's too much cholesterol in your blood, you are at a major risk for not only a heart attack, but also stroke. We're trying to prevent both. So take action. Follow your healthcare provider's advice about your cholesterol. And just like blood pressure, it's important to know what your level is. Make good, healthy food choices. Eat foods that are, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables. One of my mentors when I was in medical school said, eat smart, eat less, move more. So part of eating smart is making healthy food choices. And get active. Being physically active is a great way to control your cholesterol. Now, one important thing to know is a lot of times cholesterol is inherited, it's genetic. So a patient will come to see me in the office and they'll say, I'm doing that, I'm, I'm exercising, I'm trying to eat healthy. So that's why it's so important to know what your cholesterol level is and to control it, if necessary, with medication to prevent it from rising to a dangerous level and increasing your risk of a heart attack or stroke. Eat better. So now we're specifically talking about eating smart. Why? Think of food as your, not only your fuel, but your medicine. The way our bodies were designed, it was designed to absorb the nutrition from the food that we eat. So rather than taking 10 different vitamins or minerals that each have you know, very high levels of different uh, you know, substances that are purported to help your health, why not eat it from the food that our bodies were designed to eat? So a varied and natural, healthy diet filled with lots of fruits and vegetables and fish uh, is extremely important. So a variety of heart healthy nutrition helps keeping, keep you living at your best health potential. So take action. Say yes to, like we said, lots of fruits and vegetables. You want to eat foods that have a lot of color, colors in them, right? So red beets or strawberries or tomatoes or maybe orange carrots, uh, green kale, and you know, just fill your plate with a lot of food that has different color. That's how you know you're eating a lot of good fruits and vegetables. Whole grain carbohydrates. You don't want to overdo the carbohydrates, but when you do eat them, whole grains are better than simple carbohydrates. And watch the fat that you eat. Now, fat in moderation is okay, but too much fat, a lot of calories, you're going to pack those extra pounds. And fish with omega-3 fatty acids, one of the things 
that we as cardiologists like is something called the Mediterranean diet, which is very high in eating fish. And again, we, for those of you who live right here in Southern California, we have access to fresh fish. That's something I want you to take advantage of. Say no to foods and beverages with added sugar. Sugar is in many ways the enemy. Tastes good, do it rare uh, and sparingly because that extra sugar is not only causing you to gain weight, but it's also causing insulin spikes and causing fat deposition uh, in your internal organs, what we call visceral fat deposition. That causes more hor hormones, more inflammation, and it's thought to increase your risk for heart disease. And products high in sodium. So going back to blood pressure, too much sodium, and in fact not enough potassium, increases your blood pressure. And it can cause you to retain water and become swollen. So just watch the nutrition label for how much sodium you're consuming. Weight. So, you know, weight is such an important part because it's, you only have one body, and if you have a lot of extra pounds that your body is having to carry around, that's putting an extra strain on your heart. It's predisposing you to diabetes. It's predisposing you to fatty liver disease, and then therefore predisposing you to heart disease and stroke. So a BMI of less than 25 is optimal for cardiovascular health. So take action for effective weight loss. Choose to invest your energy on the task, not feeling guilty. Know your BMI, everything we've been talking about. You should know your numbers. Just like we say know what your cholesterol is, know what your blood pressure is, know your BMI. Know how many calories you need. So many patients come to see me in the office and they say, Doc, I'm trying to eat healthy, I'm trying to move more, the pounds are just not coming off. And what I will ask them is, are you tracking your calories? Are you actually keeping track of how many calories you are consuming and also how many calories uh, you're losing through exercise? Are you in a caloric deficit? And oftentimes when you, when you track it, you realize that even the small little snacks here and there are adding up. So your weight loss plan, you wanna reduce calories in, so plan your food choices, stick with your plan, but then also increase calories out engage in regular physical activity 30 to 45 minutes a day. And know yourself, when is a good time for you to exercise? I know for myself, if I wait till the evening to exercise, I'm tired, I've had a long day in the office, I don't have the energy. So for me, I like to exercise in the morning. But know yourself, what is the best time you like to exercise? And stick with that. Don't smoke. Okay, smoking is the number one modifiable cause of death. So if we said blood pressure is, is maybe the number one for cardiovascular health, smoking is not only for your cardiovascular health, it's for your overall health, okay? Um, so take action, talk with your healthcare provider. We care very much about the fact that you may be smoking. It's increasing your risk of heart attack, it's increasing your risk of stroke, it's increasing your risk of cancer, it's increasing your risk of emphysema. Focus on the rewards. How much better you'll feel when you stop smoking. How much money you'll save from not having to pay for the cigarettes and all those extra taxes that are associated with that. And plan your response to roadblocks. What is the reason that you continue to smoke even though you know it's bad for your health? What are your triggers? How do you tell your friends and family that you don't wanna continue smoking? Next, reduce blood sugar. Why? So high blood sugar encourages the growth of the plaque in your arteries and increases your risk for diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Take action. Make good food choices. You want to eat foods that are low in the glycemic index. Commit to regular physical activity. When you exercise, your body's using up some of that extra blood sugar so it's not being deposited as fat. And maintain a healthy weight. One of the highest risks for developing diabetes is being overweight. And we know diabetes is a major risk factor for heart disease. So these seven simple things, it's, and there's an app that you should know about called My Life Check. You can actually download the app, 
put your information in, into your phone and it will give you a score. Seven things to measure and track. So for those of you science buffs who enjoy looking at the data, looking at what happens in patients who've been tracked. And I want you to focus on this line here where the arrow is pointing. This has to do with survival. And here we're not just talking about survival in terms of your heart. We're talking about survival in terms of any cause for causing you to not survive. And what we find is in those people who maintain Life Simple 7, who start that way and maintain it throughout their life, have, have the uh, highest likelihood of survival. And the opposite is true. Those who do not have Life Simple 7 and who cannot achieve that during the course of their life have the lowest survival. So that tells me two things. Number one, what you do early in life does matter. So for those of you who are watching who might be in your 20s or 30s or 40s, this is the time to develop those healthy habits. It'll pay you dividends down the road. But the other thing it tells me is even if you did not have good uh, habits early in life, it's not too late. Turning this around will add years to your life. And we tell patients the first year you quit smoking, you reduce your risk of heart disease by 50%. So remember that, an, and we look here to Benjamin Franklin for some wisdom, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Going back to our patient, Mr. Smith, our, our example patient who came in with a heart attack, what's more worthwhile for him or her, you know, for a similar patient to work as hard as they can on Life Simple 7 or to come into the emergency room with a heart attack. So achieving Life Simple 7 does require sacrifice. It does require a lot of hard work. But I would maintain to you that all that hard work is much, much more valuable than trying to pick up the pieces once you've already, unfortunately, had a heart attack or a stroke. And so, you know, I want, as you can tell, hopefully, I'm passionate about this topic. And I consider myself and my colleagues to be preventative cardiologists. So we want to do everything we can working with you to prevent a heart attack or a stroke. If we can have you as our patient and never have that outcome, I think it's worthwhile. So what are some additional risk factors that might modify your risk? And I have that as a chart here. It includes things so a family history, if your cholesterol is extremely high, if you have kidney disease, if you have some conditions specific to women, including preeclampsia or premature menopause, if you have chronic inflammatory conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, or HIV, or even your ethnicity. South Asian patients like myself, we have an, a higher risk of heart disease just by virtue of being South Asian. So it's important to know about that risk factor so that you adjust your lifestyle accordingly. If your triglycerides are extremely high or if there are higher inflammatory markers. And what we do when we see you in the office is we work with you to identify what is your risk level. Not only where do you fare on the Life Simple 7, but also have you already developed disease, what we call subclinical disease. So you have coronary artery disease, but you don't have any symptoms. And we can do that through a variety of mechanisms, including a coronary artery calcium score, which is a low radiation CAT scan where you can actually get a score. And the perfect score, the score we're aiming for is zero. If it's zero, that means that there's been no damage as far as we could tell based on plaques, calcified plaques to your heart. But if your score is one, or 100 or 1,000, even if you don't have any symptoms, we believe you are now developing coronary artery disease, and now we need to be much more aggressive in trying to prevent a heart attack or a stroke. And on the bottom picture, you can see different kinds of particles that we measure, including something called lipoprotein A, which, if very elevated, is a genetic marker that you may be predisposed to premature heart attacks or premature strokes and we need to be very vigilant about your lifestyle and potentially put you on medicine to try to prevent a heart attack or a stroke.
So this is a patient-centered approach for what we call primary prevention. Nothing has happened yet, but we want to make sure nothing does happen. And we have to have a comprehensive approach. Social determinants of health, the stress at home, your socioeconomic, all of these things are extremely important, social determinants. A team of healthcare providers. This is not just your cardiologist, this is your primary care doctor. This might be your endocrinologist. It's a full team of doctors who are looking out for you and trying to prevent cardiovascular disease. Shared decision making. We want to talk to you, we want to educate you. That's one of the most important things we can do as your physician. We're not talking at you, we're having a discussion with you, and we want to make a shared decision-making process after you have all the information you need. And then putting that all together, we come up with a treatment plan. But the foundation is life simple seven for your health. So in summary, to be healthy is not just the absence of disease. You're not just healthy because you haven't had a heart attack or you haven't had a stroke. To be healthy is actually a collection of positive attributes. And so that takes self-reflection in all of us to think, okay, how healthy are we really? And adhering to life's simple seven, the seven steps that we talked about one by one, that is your foundation to better health. And I believe that a cardiologist who's focused on preventing heart attack, preventing stroke, can be a useful member of your medical team. So I want to thank you for your attention. And um, we, you have our information here if you want to reach out in more detail. But in the meantime, Sandra has some questions, which I'd love to address. And so a lot of questions, which is great. And that's, wh that's what I want to hear. So the first is, is a daily aspirin still a good way to prevent heart attacks? And that's an outstanding question. And for many, many years, the thought process was, yes, that a daily aspirin is a great way to prevent a heart attack. But where the field is really moving is towards a more personalized decision for you as a patient. Where do you fall on the spectrum of life's simple seven? Do you have any coronary artery calcium? All of the elevated risk factors I talked about, including do you have inflammatory diseases? Do you have a family history? Are some of your inflammatory markers elevated? We put that all together and we tell you whether we think an aspirin is a good idea because remember, even a baby aspirin, although it's a low dose, can cause bleeding. And so we have to do a risk benefit analysis with you. What is your bleeding risk? And what is your risk of a heart attack and stroke? And that's based on you as an individual. And so rather than having one blanket statement for all patients, we're really moving towards a more personalized approach. All right, second question. Does eating red meat increase the risk of heart attack and stroke? What about bread and bakery? So the answer to red meat is it can be high in cholesterol and it can be highly inflammatory, especially how you cook it. Are you barbecuing it? Are you grilling it outside? This increases the risk for highly inflammatory um, situations. So it's not just the red meat but it's also how you cook it, what you eat it with, all of these play a role. And so I want you to eat red meat sparingly. Remember, we talked in the Mediterranean diet about how important fish is and how important fish is for your heart. So I want you to really try to substitute that red meat and try to eat fish, especially if you have access to fresh fish is extremely important. What about bread and bakery? So remember I talked to you a little bit about colors in your food, red and orange and purple and green, and how important that is. And what I tell patients is if something is beige or gray or white, like white bread and pasta, and as good as that stuff tastes, it's just not good for you. It's going to cause your blood sugar to spike. It's going to cause your pancreas to have to release extra insulin. Your body's going to store that extra blood sugar as fat. And like I said, a lot of that's going to be visceral. It's going to be attached to your internal organs. And that fat, that visceral fat, is not just an inert substance. It's not just sitting there. It's actually biologically active. It's actually releasing hormones that increase your inflammation, increase your risk for heart attack, and increase your risk for stroke. And so, like for myself, I have a sweet tooth. I enjoy sweets. 
but as much as possible, can you substitute fruit for the bakery items? Can you substitute more lean protein and vegetables instead of the bakery? And this is what I mean. It's going to be a sacrifice. But I think the sacrifice is well worth it, especially when I see patients who did have a heart attack, did have a stroke, and if only they could have changed their lifestyle a few years before, we could have really hopefully tried to prevent that. Okay. Is heart disease an irreversible condition? No. And I wouldn't be doing what I did if it was an irreversible condition. I wouldn't get the enjoyment and satisfaction in seeing patients. What we love is when we can reverse your heart disease. And so that's why it's so important the sooner we address all of these issues with Life Simple 7, the sooner we can not only prevent it, but if you do have heart disease, begin to reverse it. Now, in some cases, patients have already developed coronary artery disease. They already have blockages in their arteries of their heart. They already have maybe a stent or bypass surgery. Well, obviously, in that case, we can't prevent what's already been done. But what we can do, which is extremely important, is to prevent another heart attack or another stroke. Because every time you have a heart attack or every time you have a stroke, your heart gets weaker. And your life expectancy, your, you know, what, how much longer you live goes down, and we don't want that. So that's why we divide prevention into two categories. Primary prevention means you haven't had anything yet, and we're going to do our best to prevent it. Secondary prevention means you've already had an event. Maybe you've already had a heart attack. Maybe you already have a stent. Maybe you're, you already have a stroke. And our job is to make sure you never have anything like that ever again. And so we believe with a good lifestyle, with proper attention to your blood pressure, to your cholesterol, in many, many cases, we can reverse your heart disease. And if we can't reverse it, we're going to do everything we can to prevent its progression. All right. These are great questions. Keep them coming. The next question is, I'm healthy, I exercise, I have a good weight, and I have very low triglycerides, but my cholesterol is 220. Is that bad for my heart? And that's where we look at your lipid profile. So remember, your total cholesterol includes your what's called the good cholesterol or the HDL cholesterol, as well as the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL cholesterol. And then there's a bunch of other types of cholesterol that are very bad for your heart that we're not directly measuring unless we do a specific test. So the 220, there's, there could be two different patients, each with a total cholesterol of 220, and one is doing great and one is doing terribly. And it has to do with what is your lipid profile. So if your LDL cholesterol is very high, that makes me concerned. And especially if you're, like you're mentioning here in this question, you're healthy, you're exercising, you have a good weight, and your LDL cholesterol is still very elevated, that's making me think this might be genetic. And I'm going to be very interested to know about your family history. Was there anyone early in your family history who maybe had a heart attack in their 50s? Maybe they had a uh, bypass surgery in their 50s. Maybe one of your me family members passed away suddenly in their 40s or 50s. That's really important to know. And someone who has a high cholesterol with that kind of family history we're going to be extremely aggressive with lifestyle. And if you've maximized your lifestyle, you're following Life Simple 7, and your LDL cholesterol is still high, we would recommend a, a medication to lower the cholesterol. So it all depends on you, your risk factors, and the lipid profile. Okay, next question. What about the different types of LDL? Should you have both tested? Yes. So most patients, the answer is no. You do not need different types of LDL tested. And, and really what this question is getting at is there's a bunch of different ways that it can be tested. So particle size, LDL size, but also particle number. Thank you. So all of these things um, are things we can measure, but we don't want to measure it necessarily in all patients. In patients who I feel are high risk, maybe we're not sure if we want to start a cholesterol medicine. Maybe we're on the fence. Maybe someone is, is very healthy but their family history is very concerning. Now I'm going to check this elevated profile, and we can actually check many markers beyond just particle size and particle number to get a sense of your overall metabolic health. And the more research is being done, we're identifying what we call cardiometabolic health. So your metabolism, 
what's going on in terms of what you're eating, how your body is processing the food that you eat is having a, an effect on your heart. That's the cardiometabolic. And we can actually run an advanced profile to find out about that. So really, like I said, it depends on your risk factors. That's what's going to inform me about whether I need to test more. But otherwise, if you're healthy and your LDL is not that high, in my opinion, there's really no need to go down on more advanced testing unless there's something else that's a red flag. Okay. Next question, does weightlifting lower the risk of heart attack? I actually think weightlifting is important. You know, a lot of times we emphasize aerobic exercise, walking, running, elliptical, stairmaster, swimming, and I think that's all very important. That's what we call aerobic. But there's also anaerobic training, whether that's high intensity interval training like sprinting, or whether that's lifting weights where you get your heart rate elevated to a much higher degree, I think that's important. And I think that's important for a number of reasons. It's gonna help with your weight, it's gonna help with your metabolism, it's gonna help with your bone density, and it's gonna make sure that you maintain your muscle mass. As we get older, the natural process of aging is we lose muscle mass, we become more frail, we have higher risk of falls. And so I think weightlifting is an important part of your overall health, and I think it's a good idea. But there's a caveat. You want to discuss that with your physician. There are certain medical conditions where I would really not recommend someone lifts weights, or if they do lift weights, uh, to just lift weights at a, a lower um, amount. So you really need to discuss with your patient what is, uh, sorry, excuse me, with your physician, what is your risk how much weight you can lift. Maybe it's just five pounds or maybe it's more. But I do think it's important, it can be an important part of your overall heart health to not only incorporate aerobic training, but also to incorporate anaerobic training. Okay, next question, what diet do I follow? Great question. Um, you know, one of the things we say in cardiology and in medicine in general is the diet that's best for you is the one that you can follow, right? So two people can f have two different diets, completely different, and yet they're getting equally good results. So what I like is the Mediterranean diet for myself. I like to eat a lot of healthy fruits and vegetables, limit my carbs, have um, nuts, olive oil is good, and a lot of fish. And so that's what works well for me. But that may not work well for you. You may enjoy another kind of diet. Um, you know, just like I said with exercise, I don't want you to do exercise that you hate. I want you to do exercise that you actually have fun with and enjoy. Same thing with your diet. As long as it's a healthy diet, there's more than one. So pick a diet with your physician that works best for you. But the one that works best for me is the Mediterranean diet. And Sandra's telling me here, um, if we want to keep going, we can. So what do you think, Sandra? Should we keep going or should we? Yeah, that's all the questions Perfect. That Excellent. We're going to keep going, guys. As long as you're enjoying this and finding this helpful, we'll keep going and keep those questions coming. And we'll do our best. If we do run, run out of time and you still have questions, please post it in the chat and uh, we'll do our best to get back to you and to help answer your question. So the next one is what happens if you're on Eliquis? So for those of you who may not know, Eliquis is a blood thinner. And we typically use it in patients who either have atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm, or someone who has a history of a blood clot. Maybe they've had a blood clot in their legs. Maybe they have a blood clot in their lungs. Those are usually the most common reasons for a patient to be on a blood thinner like Eliquis. And so let's talk about the, one of the most common reasons to be why we see patients who are on Eliquis. That's atrial fibrillation. There's more and more data that an unhealthy lifestyle is causing and predisposing and exacerbating your atrial fibrillation. So we can treat your atrial fibrillation. We can reduce your risk of stroke by putting you on Eliquis, by putting you on a, on a medicine to lower your heart rate. But are we really addressing the underlying reason why you have atrial fibrillation? Do you have sleep apnea? Do you have uncontrolled blood pressure? Are you not eating very healthy in a healthy way? Are you drinking too much alcohol? All of these are predisposing you to atrial fibrillation. So I would say, if you are on Eliquis, let's, let's get to the root cause for really why you're on the Eliquis, and the foundation is a healthy lifestyle.
All right. Next question. How can you figure out how many calories you need? So I'll tell you what I personally do. I'm not endorsed by them. I don't have any stake in them or anything like that. But there's a free app on the phone. It's called MyFitnessPal. And um, you can actually put your age, your gender, you put your height, you put your weight, and you put a goal. Am I trying to gain weight, lose weight, or maintain weight? And it will actually um, give you your calorie goal. And then you tell it actually how much weight you want to lose and by how quickly you want to lose it. So if you want to lose one pound a week, which is a nice conservative target, it will actually give you your calorie target. And then what you do is every time you eat something, you can actually put that in your phone and it will add up the number of calories you eat throughout the day. And then if you've got a way to track your number of steps, like I have an Apple Watch, some people have a Fitbit, or there may be other ways to track your steps, it actually keeps track of that as well. And if you're trying to lose weight, the best thing to do is weigh yourself once a week. Have a weekly weigh-in, and that's giving you real-time feedback about whether your diet and exercise is really doing the trick. So this is a great app, MyFitnessPal. It's free. I'm sure there's many others out there that are equally good, if not better. That's the one I happen to be familiar with that I personally use and I think is great. All right, next question. What is the formula to get the real total cholesterol? That is a great question. I don't know it off the top of my head in all honesty. Um, I'd have to look that one up. But it basically takes into account your triglycerides, takes into account your total cholesterol, and it gives you what's called a calculated LDL level, which is the bad cholesterol. Um, and so there is a formula to calculate that, which if any patients want to know, I usually look it up uh, when they're there in the office. All right, next question. I recently had a CAT scan of my chest. It showed minimal coronary calcification. Is it related to blood sugar or cholesterol? My answer is yes, it's probably both. It's probably the blood sugar, it's probably the cholesterol, and the more research that's being done is looking at what's called oxidative stress. So not just your cholesterol, not just your blood sugar, but the inflammation that's going on in your body is probably causing that uh, calcification. And so the minimal calcification is good. It's not means it's not too bad. But the key word is yet. It's not too bad yet. So if I were to see you and it has minimal calcification in the office, I'd want to talk to you about what are the steps we could do to keep it minimal, hopefully reverse it, but even if we can't reverse it, re uh, prevent it from progressing to mild, moderate, severe, to where we really have a problem. A few more questions here. Keep them coming, guys. Next one. Calcification runs in my family. What is calcification and how does one prevent it? Yes. This is what I'm talking about with the oxidative stress. So you have cholesterol, you have maybe elevated blood sugar, but maybe there's other reasons to have stress in your life. Maybe it's a family history. Maybe it's other problems. Maybe it's your diet. Maybe it's the lack of exercise. There's a whole host of reasons. Or maybe it's you have another disease. You've got diabetes. You've got HIV. You've got another disease. Whatever it is is causing calcification. And calcification, they, a lot of uh, research is going into this. There's not one definitive answer as far as I know. but. Uh, a lot of research, thank you, Sandra. A lot of research is being done into um, the body's response to stress, and it is believed that oxidative stress is leading to calcification. And so when we see calcification, that's a manifestation of something underlying. And we want to find out what that is so we can address the underlying cause, and then we want to address it and we want to treat it to hopefully prevent a heart attack or a stroke. Okay, the next question, what is the best way to lower triglycerides? So there's a couple of different things I think about with triglycerides. One little hint I'll, I'll um, let you guys in on is, if I see a patient in the office and they say, doc, I'm doing everything I can. I'm exercising, I'm trying to eat healthy, I'm trying to sleep you know, eight hours a night, trying to cut out the sodas, and I check their triglycerides and it's fasting. That's important. You want to make sure you don't eat or drink anything the morning that you take the blood test. And it's really high. I might want to ask them a little more detail about their diet. Because a lot of times a poor diet, the marker for that is really going to be elevated triglycerides. So I'm going to really hone in on the triglycerides as a marker 
for how good of a lifestyle are you really following. Now, in some patients, they've got an elevated triglyceride level. It may be genetic. It may be hereditary. Now, we get very concerned when the triglyceride levels are over 1,000. That actually puts you at a higher risk for pancreatitis, believe it or not. So there's other important health manifestations if your triglycerides are markedly elevated. And sometimes it has nothing to do with your lifestyle. You could be following the perfect lifestyle, and for maybe genetic or hereditary reasons, your triglyceride level is elevated. And in those cases, we really do need to get you on medication to lower the triglycerides and especially to lower your risk potentially for pancreatitis. Next question, what can I do when I take blood pressure medications but I have a standing heart rate in the 40s? Okay, so the heart rate and the blood pressure are related but they're not the same. So you could have a very elevated blood pressure and have a normal or even low heart rate. And so the key is what blood pressure medications are you on? Are you on any medication that's causing the heart rate to get too slow? And if that's the case, you may want to switch to one that doesn't have an effect or maybe has a neutral effect on your heart rate. So these two problems are separate, but they are interdependent. They are related to each other. And it is important to find out exactly what medication you're on and what other testing needs to be done to find out why your heart rate potentially is lower when you stand up. Okay. Next question, how does calcium level in the blood relate to heart disease? So for most patients, this is not a big concern. If your calcium level in your heart, in your bloodstream is normal, that is sort of independent from the calcification that's going on in your heart. However, if your calcium level is very elevated or maybe you're taking very high doses of calcium supplements, there is a thought, and more research needs to be done in this area, but there is a thought that it may predispose you to developing calcifications in your heart. So I do think it's important to maintain a normal calcium level in your bloodstream, not to overdo it in terms of calcium supplements, um, and to discuss your, with your physician further your specific case. Okay, this is a great question, the next one. What is the symptom of a heart attack? So I went to medical school in Chicago and for those of you who may be watching from someplace other than Southern California, you're probably in the middle of a blizzard right now. And what we learned in medical school, the classic example is a man who's actually shoveling out snow from his driveway. And as, he, as he's shoveling out the snow, he's, he starts clutching his chest because he's having severe chest pain and he has to rest. And he's having such severe chest pain or pressure and it's not relenting that he, dis, you know, he has to go to the emergency room and he finds out he's having a heart attack. That's the classic thing that you may be taught in medical school. But of course, in reality, not every patient presents that way. I sometimes tell my patient, you don't necessarily, you did not necessarily read the textbook. Your symptoms are not necessarily the textbook symptoms. So sometimes heart attack symptoms can be more subtle. It can be severe shortness of breath. It could be sweating. It can be pain in your jaw. It can be pain in, that's running down your arm. It can actually be uh, abdominal pain or nausea, uh, vomiting. And classically, we say women present differently than, than men. Women may be more what they say atypical. It's not the typical symptom of someone clutching their chest, feel like an elephant is sitting on their chest. It may be more subtle. It may be different. And so that's where having a high index of suspicion, meaning we're, we're going to you know, take a close look. We're not going to dismiss that symptom. Knowing your risk, knowing your history, knowing your family history, knowing life simple seven. Do you have a elevated blood sugar? Are you a smoker? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? Putting that all together, and if there is any concern, going to the emergency room if you have any worries about having a heart attack, and then seeing your cardiologist, and we can help you determine whether the symptoms that you're having may be more representative of a heart attack or may not be. What makes our job interesting but also challenging is there's so much in the chest that's not the heart. You've got your lungs, you've got your ribs, you've got your skin, you've got nerves, you've got muscle. All of these things can potentially 
cause pain. And you've also got, by the way, the, your esophagus, the tube that connects your mouth to your stomach. If you have an issue with any of that, you could be having chest pain and it may mimic a heart attack. That's what makes this challenging. And that's why you need to have a good team of doctors who are assessing your symptoms and maybe running some tests to ascertain what your risk is and helping to counsel you about that. So excellent question. We have a few more here. What is the first thing I should do if I see my 74 year old dad is having symptoms of a heart attack? Okay, great question. The first thing you should do if you're worried that you or a loved one is having a heart attack is to call 911. Don't wait, don't try to call your physician, especially if it's in the middle of the night and they're on call and they may not be familiar with your or your family member's case. Don't hop in the car and get stuck in traffic. And you know we, there are many tragic examples of patients who were in their car, on, stuck on the freeway, in traffic, trying to get to the hospital and weren't able to make it in time. So if you're worried you're having a heart attack, you're worried you're having a stroke, you're not sure what's going on, our strong recommendation is you call 911 and you uh, get the help that you need. All right, couple more questions here. What is the main difference and factor of whole wheat pasta versus regular pasta? Okay, I'd prefer if you don't really eat it, either of those, in all honesty, and if you do, you limit it. Remember, we want you to eat things that are very colorful. Pasta, things that are gray, things that are beige, they're not good for you, they're not good for your heart. So I'd really prefer you minimize your uh, intake of pasta. But if you were to have pasta, whole wheat pasta is much better than you know, your regular pasta or your pasta that's very high in glycemic index. Whole wheat it tends to take a little bit longer to digest. The blood sugar is not released into your bloodstream as quickly. And therefore, um, it's probably a, a little bit better for you than the alternative. But I really want to encourage you, we have an epidemic of, in, in my opinion, of too many carbohydrates and not enough vegetables and not enough protein. And when I say protein, I mean lean protein, things like fish. That's really what I want to emphasize, poultry. If you do eat chicken, don't eat the skin on the chicken. Make sure you're eating a lean cut of the chicken, things like that. That's really what I want you to focus on. You can envision your plate. Make sure it's filled with fish, filled with lean protein, filled with vegetables, with lots of color in them, but really limit your carbohydrates. And if you do eat carbohydrates, I'd rather you eat whole wheat or regular pasta. All right, this is fun. I'm really enjoying this. I hope you are as well. Sandra, if there are any other questions, definitely let me know. We'll keep going as long as you guys have questions. The next one here, sodium. What are the most recent daily maximum acceptable levels? Okay, thank you very much. So in terms of sodium, just like most of your questions, you guys are probably sensing a theme here. I really want to emphasize that this is personalized. You know, it depends on who you are. How active are you? If you're, a, let's say, an active bike rider and you're going out there and you're riding your bike, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles a day, you know, you're perspiring, you probably need to consume a lot more salt than if you're just sedentary, if you're just at home, you're not exercising. Similarly, what medical conditions do you have? Do you have high blood pressure? Remember, a lot of people are what we call salt sensitive. What that means is consuming sodium, especially large amounts of sodium, is causing your blood pressure to spike to an unhealthy level. And one thing that's oftentimes underemphasized or perhaps overlooked is the balance between your sodium and your potassium level. So it's not just avoiding too much sodium, but it's also making sure that you're eating enough potassium in your diet. That balance is going to be the key for you. So if you're somebody with high blood pressure, you're somebody who's got heart disease, you're somebody who I'm concerned about, your blood, you know, for especially your blood pressure, I'm going to tell you I want you to stay under two to two and a half grams of salt per day. And a lot of patients tell me, well, I'm not adding salt to my food, and, and I understand that. But if you're eating processed foods, you're eating frozen foods, all of those are increasing your risk um, and because it's got a lot of sodium built in. It's, it's inherent to the food you're eating. So even if you're not using the salt shaker, you may be really going way overboard on how much sodium you're eating. On the other hand, if you're young, you're healthy, 
you're very physically active, you enjoy exercising, then we can be a little bit more liberal with your salt intake. But remember, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So if you check your blood pressure or you notice your legs are getting swollen or your ankles are getting swollen, that might be a, a reason to really cut back on your sodium and to have more of a discussion with your physician. So we really do try to tailor it to you, the patient who's sitting in front of us, and give you our best recommendation accordingly. All right, a couple more questions here. Pork meat, lower eating to once a week is good for his heart and it may lower high blood pressure, yes. Remember, it's not just the fact that it's pork, but pork tends to be highly processed. Might be delicious, but things like bacon, things like sausage, things like that, it's gonna raise your blood pressure and a lot of these things they actually are saying, these are carcinogens, they're actually raising your risk of cancer. So I want you to eat as little pork as you can. Try to avoid it. It tends to be highly processed, tends to have a ton of sodium, and it's not only, in my opinion, raising your risk of heart disease, but it may also be raising your risk of cancer as well. So as delicious as it is, I would recommend you eat it sparingly. All right, next question. I have palpitations and tachycardia, meaning my heart rate is elevated. My normal heart rate usually low, but many times drops to 40s. I'm currently taking low doses of digoxin. Is there anything else I can do? Well, it sounds like you know a lot about your health. You're really on top of it. You know what's going on. You know what medications you're taking, and that's the first step. So whenever I see a patient in the office, I want to empower you to get the information you need to make an informed decision. But something like this, a question like this is highly personal. And I think the best thing for you to do is to see your cardiologist in the office so you can really, they can put all the information together and give you their best recommendation. But I think it's great that you're on top of your health, you know what you're taking. And for those of you who are watching who may not know the names of your medications or who may not know why you're taking your medications or what dose of the medication you're taking. Spend some time, do some reading on this because the more informed you are, the more empowered you are, now we're really a team. Now we're really working together. I like to tell my patients, I'm your coach, but you're the star player out there. You're the Michael Jordan. I'm just the coach on the sidelines trying to help you out. So the more you know, the more you're informed about your health, the better off you're gonna be. And I think we have one last question here. Um, is it okay for seniors to continue to do long distance swimming despite taking blood pressure medications or should you moderate? So what I would say with this is, as with anything, it's a risk benefit discussion with your physician. So the advice I'm gonna give, don't take this to the bank. You know, you have to really talk to your physician. But in general, in general, I think exercise is a wonderful way to lower your blood pressure. It's a wonderful way to keep your blood pressure in check. And it's a great way to just do something that improves your mood, to do something where you get fresh air, you get sunshine, and it has so many benefits uh, other than your blood pressure and other than your heart rate. So I really wanna encourage you to exercise. I think swimming is a great way to exercise, especially if you have joint problems or other things where you know, full gravity or going for a jog or something like that may be tough on your joints, then doing water aerobics or doing swimming might be a great way to do that. So I love when my patients swim, I love when my patients are physically active, but of course anything that's more specific I would want you to discuss with your physician. And so I think that might uh, bring our talk today to a wrap. I hope you enjoyed it, I certainly did. I hope you can sense that I'm very passionate I want to do everything that I can, working with your other doctors to make sure we can prevent heart disease, prevent a stroke, so you can live a life that is meaningful, that's got not just quantity, but also quality of life. Uh, our office's phone number is here. Please give us a call. Sandra, I'm sure you'll let me know if there are other questions that come through the chat. We'll do our best to answer them. Hopefully you got some value from doing this, and hopefully I can come back and give you guys some more talks and discussions for follow-up in the future.